alustame tänase loenguga, ma näen siin saalis praegu ühte inimest, kes vist ei oska eesti keelt. On nii, Robert vist ei räägi eesti keelt. Aga äkki ma sisse juhatuse siiski teeks eesti keelest, sest loeng nüüd järgneb küll inglise keeles ja ma lühidalt tutvustaks Lars-Frederik Stökkerit, kes on meil siin arhiivis juba poolteist nädalat külas olnud ja väga tubli tööd teinud, uur ja tööd nii arhiivis kui kui Toronto linna peal. Meie kohtusime Lars-Fredrikuk esimest korda Tartus 2009 sügis. Ma ikka räägin seda siin teda tutvustades, et siis me vahetasime viisakus eesti keeles, aga kui tööjutu hakkasime rääkima, läksime inglise keele peale üle. Ja nüüd on ta siin teist korda Torontos käimas ja me ei ole oma vahel inglise keelt üldse enam rääkinud. No tema tutvustuseks kõik alati küsivad, kui nad ka siin bibliograafia klubi, kes tema ilusat eesti keelt kuulis ja seda nime vaatas, et noh, et mis su nagu taust on. Frederiku isa on sakslane, ema on rootslane, aga eestlane ei ole ta kusagilt otsast. Nii et eesti keelt hakkaski uurima selle oma uurimistöö pärast. Ja peale selle oskab ta veel väga mitmeid keelimad ja kas neid oli nüüd viis või kuus või oli neid seitse. Rootsi, saksa. Inglise, Itaalia, Poola, Leedu, Eesti, praegu õpib vene keelt. Noh, aitab, mina ei suuda meeles pidada nii palju keeli, mida tema oskab. Hetkel on Frederik ametis Tallinna ülikooli juures, ta on seal postdoktorantuuris ja on lugenud seal ka kursus ja ka põhiliselt teeb oma teadustööd. Aga praegu ongi tal natuke murelikud ajad, ärevad ajad, mis sugune uurimisprojekt, kus maagera punktist ta oma uurimistööd jätkata saab. Ja toiame talle kõik põhjalt, et ta selle tulevase stipendiumiga saaks, sest see uurimistöö, mida ta tuli Torontosse tegema, on väga põnev ja meie jaoks ka väga oluline. See puudutab majanduskoostööd, mida siis tegelikult. Tegid Balti riigid 80. aastate lõpul, võtleme selle laulva revolutsiooni ajal Eesti ja Leedu just on see ja Ukraina, mis teda nagu huvitavad sellest piirkonnast ja kuidas siis nende rahvuste diaspora kogukonnad sellele uuendamisele, uuendamise majanduselu käivitamisele ja kõigile uuendustele kaasa said aidata. Aga Fredriku akadeemiline tee on tõesti väga rahvusvaheline ja Ja ta on väga mitmetes paikades Euroopas õppinud ja tööd teinud. No neid siit varasemast nimetama hakates on siis European University via Adriana Frankfurt ooteri ääres. Siis on ta olnud Kraakovi ülikooli juures, Kraakovis, Jagiel Loonian ülikooli juures, Erasmuse üliõpilasena. Ja... Ja oma doktoritöö tegi ta Firenzes Itaalias koguni ja selle töö teema, selle ma loen küll inglise keeles ette, see on siis Bridging the Baltic Sea Networks of Resistance and Opposition During the Cold War. Nii et see on selle tänase ettekandega põhiline alus. Oma uuest teemast ta meile veel ei räägi. Ja tegemist on väga toreda ja toeka inimesega, ma võin öelda, nii et nähes, kuidas Fredrik siin on kahte, oma kahte nädalat kasutanud, siis ma ei imesta üldse, kuidas selle stipendiumi lähemal ajal ikkagi saab ja lähema paari, kolme, nelja aasta jooksul selle oma järgmise uurimuse valmis teeb ja raamat on tal praegu ka doktori tööst ilmumas peadselt, mille kallal ta töötab, nii et soovime talle kõigeks selleks jõudu ja loodame, et me saame teda siin endise aasta rontost tulevikus näha, sest selle esimese See käigu ka tõestis ta saab uuele teemal alles nii öelda hoo sisse lükata, aga palju uuri, mis siin koha peal on veel ees. Nii et palume lavale meie külalise Lars Fredriks Tökker. Ole hea! Joo, ei täs ole piirat. Jah, mul on natuke nii piin, et ma peaks tegelikult nagu seda kõned eesti keeles pidema. Aga... Meie teadnud üldse, kes tuleb, kas kõik räägivad Eesti keelt või mitte. See on või tüüd in English, which is much easier for me. English is the language in which I do my research. As Pirat has already told you a bit about my about my academic life, I've been in several places. I started 
my studies in, in Germany, then I went to Poland for a while, as she said, I did my PhD about this topic uh, in Florence, lovely Florence in Tuscany, uh, which was a strange place to write about the Cold War in, in the Baltic Sea region. It seemed so remote uh, in a way. Yeah, and um, this uh, interest I developed in, um, in uh, the Estonian exile, not actually in the beginning in Estonia itself, but in the exile, uh, finally brought me to Estonia. So, so this is uh, where I'm teaching and working at the moment at uh, Tallinn University at the Institute of History. Mm. Yeah, so, so um, academics nowadays uh, often are forced to be nomads in a way. <laughs> We're moving from one place to another and uh, uh, and now my research has brought me to Canada. I wouldn't have thought that some, some years ago, but, um, but it's very interesting. I'm very happy to be here. And I'm in good hands. Piret takes very good care of me, and uh, I've, uh, I had uh, yeah, very fruitful, uh, how, how much is it, 12 days now uh, here in Canada, and I will, I will certainly come back. Uh, as you know, uh, the archives down in the cellar are uh, vast, there's a lot of material to find, and I've only had a glance at, at a little percentage of it, so I have to come back and um, uh, go on with my, with my current topic. Uh, so actually what I'm going to do now is going, in a way, going back in time. This was uh, the topic which I researched on for about uh, five, five and a half years, I think. Mm, and as you can see from the title, it's about uh, the contacts between um, the Estonian exile community in neutral Sweden and which you can say in, in the broadest meaning non-conformist circles, politically non-conformist circles in Soviet Estonia. And I'm going to talk, which you don't see from the title, especially about the early uh, 70s until the mid 80s. Um, that was then the years before contacts between the Estonian emigration and the home country could develop on a larger scale than with the onset of Mikhail Gorbachev's uh, policy of perestroika and glasnost. Um, everyone hears me, I hope. Yeah, does the microphone work? Um, so this um, lecture touches upon actually only one of the case studies which I, uh, which I worked on in my doctoral dissertation. Uh, which I then defended in Florence uh, at the European University Institute one year and a half ago. Uh, the topic of uh, my dissertation was uh, the political activities of exile communities from behind the Iron Curtain in Neur neutral Sweden throughout the Cold War area. That, that means from the late 40s until uh, uh, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, more or less, in, in 91. Uh, and I did a comparative uh, research on Poles in Sweden and Estonians. And the common feature was uh, I wanted to find out how these exile activists used the, the quite specific kind of contacts that existed during the Cold War between the neutral Nordic countries and the communist countries on the opposite coasts. Um, which, which, so the Baltic Sea region was, uh, was an exception, actually, as, 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 an, as a borderland in, in divided Europe, where contacts uh, in many ways were possible on a much larger scale than maybe in, in other parts of, uh, around, not along the Iron Curtain, as in continental Europe, where the political tensions were much, uh, were much more obvious. So in a way, the neutrality of Sweden and Finland um, took out some of the tension and made it possible to to bring societies together on a, on, on another level. So, um, uh, to yeah, to say it in one word, my research interests uh, has been the Cold War era in Europe or life in Cold War Europe, and then especially uh, how contacts, how exchange, how interaction between individuals, groups, and societies um, could develop in, in different phases of, of the Cold War. And this is actually, now I speak a bit about my, my field in general, uh, Cold War historians have only lately started to, 
to research on these, these contacts, which were not contacts between governments uh, or international organizations, but which were contacts uh, in everyday life, which were face-to-face -face contacts or, or uh, at first glance, non-political interaction like cultural exchange. The, the field is, is, is very broad and is only uh, being explored by, by a new generation of, uh, of historians at the moment. Because uh, the field of Cold War historiography was for many decades dominated by American scholars, um, especially, who, but they had this uh, uh, transatlantic uh, perspective. They uh, focused on the superpower conflict. They focused on the relations between Moscow and Washington. So the stress was, was mostly on the political and diplomatic uh, aspects of the Cold War. So it was mostly about American political strategies in the Cold War, about uh, reforms in the Soviet Union and how they affected the relations between the US and the Soviet Union. Uh, so, so Europe somehow, the divided continent somehow fell out of this narrative. It was all about the, the superpower dimension. And uh, Europe as, as a political actor disappeared somehow in this, um, in this uh, narrative. Uh, and still today, this image of the Iron Curtain is, is so powerful, is uh, so, still so present today. I mean, the, 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 most, um, the most powerful image is the Berlin Wall. So, so the fall of communism is directly uh, leads the thoughts to, to the fall of the Berlin Wall, because this was uh, the very physical symbol of, uh, of divided Europe. So, um, and as you can see on the map, this division is, is always very graphic. It's, uh, it's about two blocks, and the neutrals uh, are, are gray, actually, but it's, uh, it's this uh, dichotomy of, of, of two worlds. And this uh, has, to a large degree, shaped our own perception of how life in, in divided Europe actually was like. So uh, very many of these uh, levels underneath the governmental contacts underneath the diplomatic contacts uh, have been overshadowed. So, as I said, during the last 10 years, uh, especially European scholars have started to take an interest in how much interaction actually was possible. Uh, because the Iron Curtain was not, as in, as in divided Berlin, always built of bricks and barbed wires. Uh, in fact, uh, there has been a lot of uh, interesting studies in recent years uh, about, for example, tourism between the blocks, which was quite uh, uh, intense, especially after the 1960s, uh, about trade between the blocks, about the cooperation between companies, about technological cooperation, uh, about technological transfer, especially to the Eastern Bloc from the West, uh, or cultural exchange, such as... Um, guest visits of, of theater companies or operas or, or whatever. The field is um, very broad. And all these studies contribute to, to, to give us a, a, a more nuanced picture, an imagination of, of uh, how East and West uh, were related to each other uh, after all. Uh, an aspect which is uh, under-researched, uh, by contrast, is... Uh, the political dimension. I don't speak about the political contacts between governments, but uh, the political contacts which developed underneath the official level. You might call them clandestine contact, contacts or subversive contacts or, uh, or whatever you like. So the cooperation between anti-communist groups uh, or as I prefer to, to call them oppositional groups because not all of them were uh, were anti-communist, if you think about uh, the, the many reform Marxists in the Eastern Bloc who wanted reform, who were critical of the government, but you can't call them uh, anti-communists. So I prefer the notion of oppositional groups on both sides of, of the Iron Curtain. Uh, their contacts are, are, are still uh, not researched on at all, almost. I think my, my book is one of the, the first um, uh, projects which have taken this challenge.
Uh, and I think one of the, the main reasons that these uh, kind of uh, conspirational contacts have not been uh, res researched on so much is the fact that very much built on, on, on uh, secret channels, on, on, on uh, cooperation which stayed out of the public light. So the historian is, is confronted with the dilemma that such kind of interaction doesn't leave so many traces. We historians, we need written documents. We, we need to go into the archives. And actually, what is, um, what is a pity is the fact that um, uh, the Western intelligence services have certainly a lot of interesting material for my research. I, uh, I would never get into them. Maybe no one can. They're still closed. Uh, in, in the Eastern Bloc, on the other hand, uh, the intelligence services have uh, collected uh, an interesting vast amount of material about these kinds of contacts. But the problem is, again, that, uh, of course, these archives are open as the states they work for don't exist anymore. But the problem is, for example, in the Soviet Baltic Republics, the KGB archives are disappeared. They, they are not there. We have, during my research, I, I found um, only some, some documents from the 50s, but everything after 1956 is basically gone. Uh, Estonian historians have claimed that uh, when the Soviet Union broke down that uh, everything was taken to Russia, maybe we have some kind of secret archive in Russia where all this interesting documentation is, but uh, the Russian government would not, uh, not let anyone uh, see them, at least not at the moment. So the problem was, uh, where do I find my, my information? So what I used in my research were the vast archives of the Estonian exile organizations in Sweden. Not only the, the exile organizations, but also uh, and I think I speak about something which, which, you, which you perfectly know, that very many uh, archival collections of documents are still at home. People, people keep them at home. They have them in their cellars or on the attics. Um, and uh, some of these uh, collections um, finally arrive at some archive, as I've seen here in Toronto. Um, but some of this, uh, these collections have come to, to Tallinn, to the National Archive, so that's where I've been sitting for a long time. And uh, then I have done quite a lot of interviews, both with uh, exiled Estonians from Sweden, but also with uh, a whole number of Estonian dissidents and um, politicians. I guess you're famili familiar with many of the names. It's, uh, for example, Tunne Kellam or Eve Pernas, who was a dissident, uh, Lakle Parek, um, Vello Salo, who was a Catholic priest, but also involved in, in, in uh, this um, secret cooperation. Uh, so I was nevertheless able to, to get uh, a huge amount of interesting material, which made it possible to, to write this book in the end. Uh, Sweden was, as much as Toronto was... Uh, the North American capital of, of exiled Estonia, so to say, Sweden was the, the European stronghold of, uh, of Estonians. And uh, what I'm actually going to talk about, I mean, you see on the map, geography matters, space matters, and uh, the geographical proximity of Stockholm, uh, which is uh, on the eastern coast to, to Tallinn, I think if you would... Uh, if, if, you, if you see the, the, the distance, it's only, I think, it's 300 kilometers. Uh, that had a huge impact on how communication developed between uh, exiles in Sweden and the homeland. Uh, because, um, yeah, some circles in, in, in uh, neutral Sweden, some Estonian circles, uh, knew very well how to use uh, the so-called uh, Sommersilt, like the Finnish bridge, uh, the communication went then mostly by, via Helsinki. Um, I, will, I will summarize some of my research uh, results now in this um, speech, but nevertheless, I, I would like to, to give a short overview uh, over the historical context about uh, how communication between the exile community and the occupied home country, um, let's say, started in, in the mid-60s. I think most of you are very familiar with that, but I will nevertheless take a short, um, uh, a short overview over the topic. Uh, 
um, it was in the early 60s that um, the Hoover Institution in Stanford published, uh, published a research uh, project about political exile communities in the West, not only from behind the Iron Curtain, even, even from Greece or from, from Spain or from Portugal, uh, which had huge dias diaspora uh, communities, uh, both in North America and Western Europe. And this um, study stated that uh, the Estonians were actually the politically most active diaspora group in the West, at least from Central and East Eastern Europe. Uh, and this was um, uh, meant concerning their very strong lobbying activity, as, uh, as, as you all know, the, the countless resolutions and appeals to Western government governments. Uh, and the main aim was, of course, to, to uh, influence not only Washington, but also Western European uh, governments to maintain the line of non-recognition of the annexation in 1940. So this, this branch of political exile activity was very strong in the case of the Estonians, but at the same time, the Bolts were the political diaspora, diaspora group with least contacts to their home country. And this is, uh, of course, as you again know, uh, one of the reasons was that um, the overwhelming majority of Bolts refused to uh, establish any kind of um, contacts or exchange with the occupied home countries at least uh, as long as uh, it has to, to it, it had to go by our Soviet authorities. And another reason was of course that um, the Soviet Baltic Republics were the western borderlands of the Soviet Union recently annexed only during World War II and thus very strictly uh, shielded from any kinds of influences from the West. You see here a map um, of um, the Soviet Estonian border regime. Um, you see that basically uh, the whole coastline was a military exclusion zone. Uh, the beaches were raked, there was uh, barbed wire along, along the beaches and the islands were, uh, were not possible to visit even for most Estonians if they did not have a uh, a special permit from the from uh, the authorities. So, um, and you see that there were so many military bases, uh, which also were uh, sensitive areas, so that uh, practically the whole republic was closed for foreign visitors, uh, except the capital uh, of Tallinn. But uh, first, in it was first in the mid '60s actually that things began to move slowly. Mm. I, I read some KGB reports from the late 50s and, and from them you can see that actually already from the mid 50s onwards after Stalin's death uh, foreign delegations had been visiting uh, Estonia, Tallinn. Uh, it was mostly delegations either of communist parties from other western states or it was um, sportsmen's delegations or trade unions, unionists and they were for the most part, uh, most, most of them were actually from Finland or from Sweden or then from non-European countries as Brazil. So it was again this neutrality of Sweden and Finland which made a kind of more uh, closer uh, cooperation possible. But then from 1960 onwards it was possible to visit Tallinn as a tourist. At that time you still had to take the, uh, the long way via Helsinki and Leningrad and then you had to uh, to get a tourist guide who, who took you from Leningrad to Tallinn. Uh, and things became much easier than in um, 1965 when, when Soviet Estonia, as a kind of experimental republic uh, of the Soviet Union, turned into a kind of, um, into, into a goal for, for actually mass tourism from the West. And this development uh, began, as you know, of course, uh, with the um, opening of the ferry connection between Helsinki and, uh, and Tallinn, which, uh, which was only about 80 kilometers and made it much easier uh, to visit Soviet Estonia. And here the credit goes, of course, to the Finnish president, uh, Urho Kekkonen, uh, who actually, even before the war, was known as, a, as an estophile. And he had, since the late 1950s, been trying to, to convince the Soviet leadership to, to, to allow for 
a more closer exchange between Finland and the Soviet uh, Estonia directly. Uh, and it's actually interesting to note that um, uh, the ferry connection was re-established in 1965, but uh, Kekkonen had to promise something in return. It was um, already since the late 40s that Finnish intellectuals had been uh, very active in, community, in communicating with the uh, exile community in Sweden. It was a kind of substitute for not being able to continue the pre-war contacts to, to Estonia. And uh, Khrushchev said to, to Kekkonen that basically uh, the price for this direct connection between Helsinki and Tallinn was uh, to cut all connections to the exile community. So uh, before, before 1965, uh, exile writers could publish in Finnish, uh, Finnish newspapers. Uh, the, cultural life in ex uh, the cultural life of Estonians in, in, in Swedish exile uh, had some space in, in the Finnish media, but this changed uh, with, the, with the onset uh, of, of uh, the new uh, relations which could develop between uh, Finland and Soviet Estonia. So President Kekkonen invited a number of uh, prominent Finnish estophiles to his house. And, um, uh, and um, explained the situation. I said, now we have to, to uh, reconsider our relations to Estonia. And we should, if we want to continue Finnish-Estonian cooperation, we should now focus on Soviet Estonia, not on the exile community anymore. Uh, but then, yeah, then the day came. In, we, we see a picture here of uh, the motorship uh, Vanemuine. Uh, this is um, uh, the opening ceremony in the harbor of Tallinn. Uh, the motorship Vanemuine was the first Estonian ferry which uh, took, took passengers from Helsinki to Tallinn uh, and back. And it was in 1965, we see it was uh, opened, it's not written, it was opened on, on the 8th of July. And during the first summer season, as many as 19,000 tourists traveled across the Gulf of Finland. And uh, the number of passengers quickly rose so that um, this uh, relatively small ferry had to be replaced by a bigger one, uh, which was then the MS Tallinn. Uh, and in 1968, only three years uh, after the reopening of the ferry connection, as many as 24,000 passengers uh, traveled between these cities. Uh, among them were 2,000 uh, Soviet Estonian citizens as well which were then mostly already elderly people or pensioners who, who got the permit to, to visit family members in Sweden. Um, but already in the early 60s, the first exiled Estonians from Sweden uh, had already traveled to Estonia on private visits to visit family and friends. Uh, but as this uh, ferry connection was established, their number quickly rose. So in 1965, uh, 800 exiled Estonians from Sweden visited the Soviet Union, and one year later it was uh, as much as 1,000 who entered the country together with the masses of mostly Finnish tourists. Uh, it took a bit more time for the North American Estonians to, to take the decision, but, but in the late 60s, even their number was, was quickly growing as visitors. In, in Soviet Estonia. Um, but of course, even private visits were, were not uncontroversial, uh, especially in the discourses uh, that developed within the exile communities. Um, because the problem was that the, the non-recognition of the annexation of 1940 on the part of the exile Estonians was, was a kind of ideological bedrock on which the whole existence of being a political refugee community was based. So um, visiting occupied Estonia meant, in other words, to, to break an unwritten law of uh, the, the society of political refugees. Um, as every visitor who wanted to go to Estonia had to apply for a Soviet visa, either at a Soviet embassy or consulate, and uh, these 
diplomatic representations were them at the same time representations of the occupying power. And uh, every kind of cooperation with them meant, uh, in other words, to, to undermine the, the self-perception of, of the exile community. Um, however, by, by the mid-60s, um, this um, ideological construct was, was slowly changing. It was um, a second generation of exiles who had come either come to, to, uh, to the West as children or who had already been born in exile who um, preferred to, to, to approach the problem from, a, from another angle. And uh, a, a, an increasing number of them increasingly challenged this um, very strong anti-communism or anti-Sovietism, which was very much alive uh, among the war refugee generation. So um, at the same time, we have to see that the political climate in the West was changing. Uh, it was uh, the high tide of the new left, and um, this, um, this very strict dichot dichotomy be between East and West, between the US on the one side and the Soviet Union on the other side, was, uh, was in the flow, was, was changing. So uh, the high tide of anti-Sovietism and anti-communism, which was the 50s, was, was over. And uh, in these new circumstances, even the United States, which had been seen as the most powerful ally of, of the Baltic exile communities, uh, were uh, developing different ways of communicating with the Soviet Union and with the entire Eastern Bloc. So, so uh, they promoted exchange, they promoted... Uh, student exchange, they sent uh, scholars to the Soviet Union. Uh, it was just other times. So in this turn in, in international politics, uh, without doubt, influenced even the discourses within the exile community. So um, um, in the beginning it was actually Sweden which became the leading center for these new kinds of discourses. Um, but especially after the Prague Spring in 1968, uh, even exile intellectuals in, of a younger generation in, in the US and Canada developed similar, um, similar um, strategies. For example, I don't have to tell you about Metsa Ulikol, the Forest University, which became one of the most important forums of, of discussing new ways of, of uh, dealing with this uh, problem of, of the geopolitical situation in, in Estonia. Uh, and it was the impact of the Prague Spring was that uh, after the invasion of, of the Warsaw Pact forces in Prague, in Czechoslovakia, uh, people started to understand that the communist system or that this division of Europe would prevail for a long, long uh, time. And this had, of course, also a huge impact on, on the political visions for the future of Estonia, which among the war generation, of course, was unchanged. Uh, we will be fighting until Estonia will be free. While the, the younger generation said, but if it won't, we have to find a solution to, to, uh, to influence the situation in another direction. So they, some of them, you might know the name, Rein Tagepera, developed, um, he was a political scientist and he, he developed new, uh, new visions, for example. He, he talked about the Finlandization of Estonia, uh, or even uh, the satellization of Estonia. So could Estonia break out of the Soviet Union uh, and become one of the states of the satellite belt, like it, it, with a greater amount of national autonomy, like Poland or Hungary or um, Czechoslovakia? But this, um, this was by some circles seen as a kind of uh, treason. Um, and, and triggered, uh, triggered partly very emotional reactions, especially among the generation of, of war refugees. And uh, it was here again the contrast between the Estonians in Sweden and the Estonians in, in North America that um, the attitudes, the prevailing attitudes uh, towards every kind of communication with Soviet Estonia was much more stricter, especially here in Canada, as I've learned. Uh, as there were extreme voices who uh, 
representatives of the conservative camp who were convinced of that uh, the majority of Estonians in Soviet Estonia had already been compromised by, by the communist system, so that the only, I quote, nationally healthy part of the nation uh, were to be found in exile. Um, in Sweden, this attitude was, as I've said, less orthodox. But on the other hand, you, you had also cases which cases of almost hysterical uh, reactions. For example, in 1961, which was um, right in the beginning when travels were, were possible to Estonia, uh, the famous composer Eduard Tubin uh, decided to accept an invitation to Tallinn, where one of his ballets was, uh, was being performed. Um, and when he came back, for example, he was thrown out of his fraternity. Uh, it was... Um, it was, um, yeah, he, he caused a, a big scandal. And in other cases, um, exile, uh, Estonian emigrants in Sweden remember that uh, Estonian newspapers in Sweden published the names of those who had gone to the homeland, which, which then uh, at times led to their social exclusion within the exile community. But in general, we can say that a significant part of, uh, of the Estonians in Sweden still supported the idea of making use of the liberalized border regime in the Soviet Union and even promoted traveling to Estonia. And there were also prominent voices from overseas who supported them, as we can see in this uh, letter from the exiled writer Karl Ast, uh, at that time in New York, which he wrote to uh, the writer Raymond Kolk in Stockholm. Um, I, I quote uh, the original um, Estonian version. Um, I don't have to translate it, apparently. Um, but uh, he, he, yeah, he, he basically stated that uh, the aging rose of the political exile leadership uh, slowly turned into an anachronism as a remnant of a, of a time gone by, which was, as he highlighted, the fate of all exiled communities. So he turned with an appeal to the Estonians in Sweden to use any possible channel of communication with the, with the compatriots at home. So uh, the last sentence he wrote, you there, he wrote, you there in Sweden should do everything that is possible in order to establish relations with the homeland to get to know and to understand the people at home. Because after all, um, there was a, a kind of hidden political agenda even behind the private visits uh, to Soviet Estonia. On the one hand, mm, many exiled Estonians were convinced of the fact that a division of, of such a small nation as the Estonian nation into two camps and cultures would uh, considerably lower the prospects of a future liberation. Uh, on the other hand, uh, an increasing number of exiles were convinced of the fact that any kind of national emancipation had to develop from within Soviet Estonian society, uh, which was a task which could not entirely be taken over by the exile. So in a way we see uh, a kind of uh, strategy which reminds of uh, the change through rapprochement, which was um, the, the way of many Western governments in the 60s to, to approach the Soviet bloc. Let's, um, let's foster exchange. Let's, let's, let's make people meet, and this will change the system from within. So the same kind of um, political strategy developed uh, within the exile community. Um, the, the point was that private contacts, uh, let it be family visits, whatever, and travels to Estonia were meant to weaken the strict censorship policy of the Soviet Union, uh, and the aim was to, to supply the, the homeland population with unfiltered information. So it was, it was this face-to-face -face approach um, in order to, to, to spread uh, to spread information and to, to boycott the, the attempts of the Soviet authorities to isolate the, uh, the territory from Western influences. So, and especially important in this context was also uh, 
to inform the homeland population about the political struggle in exile uh, and the various um, attempts of exile activists and organizations to influence Western governments. It was supposed to show that uh, there is a fight for Estonian liberation and uh, the, the effect was to, to, to boost the morale of the, of the homeland. Um, another strategy which um, was developed by exile activists in, activists in Sweden was um, the establishment of, at first glance, unpolitical cultural exchange between uh, exile and homeland, which then was perfectly uh, in harmony with the, with the policy of the Swedish government at the time. They also wanted to, to increase interaction with the communist societies. And uh, uh, exile activists were actually able to, to use this as a, as a bridge. So um, the aim was to, to uh, foster cultural contacts and thus to, to counteract the Russification and Sovietization policies, which were quite strong in Estonia and the other Baltic states as well. And this is why many exiles uh, actually agreed to cooperate with the so-called VEXA, which was uh, the Society for the Development of Cultural Ties with Estonians Abroad, a Soviet Estonian authority, which was, as everyone knew, even at the time, was de facto controlled and uh, led by the KGB. Uh, but this kind of cooperation was a very controversial topic and, and remained a very controversial topic for a long time, even among the exile community in Sweden. Um, the flagship, as you can call, as you can call it, uh, of this new political strat strategy was the Baltic Institute in Stockholm, which was founded in 1970. And the institute was established by a number of younger exile scholars. It was, it was a joint uh, enterprise of, of both Estonians, Latvians, and Lithuanians living in Sweden. In the beginning, uh, the young scholars who, who started this project of the Baltic Institute involved also the political exile organizations. Uh, but soon, the leadership of the institute um, tried to disconnect the activities from the political exile, um, as they, they quite rightly assumed that uh, any cooperation uh, with the political organizations would then be an op obstacle in establishing uh, contacts with scholars in the Soviet Baltic republics. So in the end, the institute did not become another exile or refugee or, or organization. Uh, as the second generation of, of uh, exile intellectuals were very well connected or, or integrated into, Swedish, into the Swedish academic landscape, the, the Baltic Institute soon became part uh, of the University of Stockholm. So it was thus covered by a higher educational institution of a neutral country, which then, of course, made it possible to, to uh, establish cooperation with institutions in the Soviet Union, as the neutral countries were uh, throughout the Cold War seen as a kind of friendly neighbors with, with whom it was easier to, to, to make contact on, on different levels. So um, here you see uh, the very first conference organized uh, by the Baltic Institute in Stockholm, which was held at Hesselby Slot, the, the castle of Hesselby. Uh, in June 1971, I, I'll show you just, uh, this was the second one, it was biannual conferences, so it was um, uh, in 1973 already, and we see the third conference of the Baltic Institute, again two years later in 1975, which as you can see uh, gathered already a considerably, considerably larger number of participants, and actually on on this picture, you can see uh, Prime Minister Olaf Palme <laughs> speaking at, at the ev event. And he was not known to be a friend of, of the Baltic exile communities, at least officially. He, he represented a very uh, pronouncedly leftist stance in Swedish politics and, and uh, did not like to interfere in Soviet domestic affairs. So the Baltic, the Baltic issue was, was quite infected. But Nevertheless, unofficially, he still spoke at events like uh, like 
the conference of the Baltic Institute. Um, but it was actually not before 1981 that Soviet Baltic scholars uh, could participate and could, um, uh, could be invited as guests to the Baltic conferences. And, uh, but on the other hand, the, the cooperation quickly developed. It was, for example, possible to, to invite over uh, both scholars and, and, and artists from, from Estonia, Latvia, and, and Lithuania to Stockholm, even for the period of several months. So uh, they were then financed by, by the Baltic Institute. They, they, got a, they got an apartment in Stockholm and could stay for a longer time. Um, but um, still in 90, 1981, when the first representatives from Soviet uh, institutions um, participated at the conference, the reactions were still very critical uh, from some point. As uh, Alexander Lloyd, who, who is a historian from Uppsala, told me, uh, one Estonian newspaper here in North America, I don't know if Canada or the US, uh, wrote about the 30 particip participants from the Soviet Baltic states as the 30 Czechists um, who came to Stockholm. But again, there were many voices uh, who actually defended the strategy of not only inviting scholars, but also artists to Sweden in cooperation then with Swedish universities and uh, museums, theaters, uh, whatever it was. Uh, as they said, the possibility to, to come to Stockholm for a longer period of study or cultural exchange uh, provides a kind of breathing space uh, for the Soviet Estonian intelligentsia. Um, so in the long run, uh, this cooperation uh, launched by the Baltic Institute led to quite durable connections across the Baltic Sea between the intellectual elites both in, in uh, exile and uh, the occupied home countries. And this can be seen as a, as a major success of the bridge building policy of, of the younger generation of exiles, as it uh, in a way led to a kind of uh, ideological rapprochement between Estonians on both sides of the Iron Curtain. And this certainly formed the basis for, for future corporations, which had a, even a strong oppositional or political aspect that um, should not be underestimated. And actually, as it turned out, um, this uh, new strategy or this new stance of many younger exiles uh, who voted for closer contacts and cooperation with the homeland uh, as a kind of powerful means against Russification and Sovietization was reflected by uh, representatives of the intellectual elites in Soviet Estonia. And this uh, became obvious already in 1976 uh, in an anonymous manifest which had been smuggled from, from Estonia uh, out of the country, most probably on the ferry to Finland, and which reached then the exile community in Sweden. Um, the letter was signed by the Association of Thinking Estonians, or the Mutleva Deislaste Uhendus, which was a group, an anonymous group. I, I, I couldn't figure out myself who they actually were, um, which was based in Tallinn and Tartu and had addressed this letter to uh, the organizers of the Estonian World Festival Esto, which was to, held, to be held in Baltimore in um, 1976. And this is only a, a, a small extract from the very long letter, which, which uh, had, had a dozen of pages um, and was um, published, as you can see here, in the Canadian exile journal Mariama Esti Katholik Lasterinkiri, um, and the whole letter is, is basically uh, an, an analysis of the relations between exile and homeland and uh, how they should develop. So um, about this short extract here at this point, the years of separation have led to alienation and prejudices, prejudices between us. But nevertheless, we need each other. We are bound together not only by a common past, but even by a common future. It has turned out that we instinctively have moved towards the same goals, but only under different conditions and using different methods. So our appeal to the exile Estonians is, 
don't refrain from visiting the home country, but come here more often, and if possible, in larger numbers. So in a way, this uh, message strengthened and justified the new political course developed by uh, the younger exiled intellectuals in, in neutral Sweden and North America as well. So, um, as, we, as we have seen, Sweden played still a, a, a leading role as, or a key role as a major hub for this developing communication between exile and homeland, which developed on various levels, um, not at least to this um, political and ideological flexibility of the younger exile generation. But now I would like to talk about um, a second level of cooperation, which was uh, a bit uh, out of the public light, and which maybe until, until today is not so, so broadly and, and well known. Um, because already when the ferry connection between Helsinki and Tallinn was re-established in 1965, the political exile leadership in Stockholm realized that this was a loophole in the Iron Curtain and, and uh, recognized its significance even for, for political purposes. Um, so here you see, uh, this is the original English version of a report uh, which was written by Arvo Horm in Stockholm. So on July 8, 1965, a regular shipping route between Helsinki and Tallinn was opened, which has also opened up a novel and interesting road and made it practically possible to send materials, information, tourists, observers, etc., via this route. And just some um, remarks about who Arvo Horm actually, actually was. Uh, he was the secretary of um, the Estonian National Council, which was the, the main uh, political exile organization of Estonians in Sweden. Uh, and he had come to Sweden already in 1943, when Estonia was still occupied by, by Nazi Germany. And he played actually a key role in the communication between the resistance movement uh, in Estonia and uh, the Estonian diplomats in, in uh, Stockholm and Helsinki. Uh, so he, he was very well familiar with uh, clandestine forms of, uh, of surmounting boundaries and, and uh, keeping up communication across the Baltic Sea. Um, yeah, but this was a, a little sidetrack only. Um, this um, ferry connection between Tallinn and Helsinki actually at, at an early stage proved uh, the rule that any small opening up to the west meant a loss of control by, by the communist authorities. And this was, uh, in the 1960s, a quite general problem for, uh, for the governments of communist Europe because... On the one hand, east-west detente led to, to uh, an increasing amount of contacts between the blocs. Uh, uh, societal exchange was promoted, uh, trade was developing, tourism was developing between the blocs. Um, and this was also important to, to the communist system itself because um, tourism meant hard currency. And hard currency was Western hard currency was badly needed um, in the Eastern Bloc countries at the time. They could be spent on consumption, which then took out the tension, which were visible throughout the Soviet Bloc. So it was a kind of social contract. Uh, consume, but be, but be quiet, <laughs> basically. So, um, so this influx of Western tourists and, and the opening up to Western mass tourism was, uh, was an important source of income but at the, time, the, at the same time, the communist governments had to understand that it had a lot of unwanted side effects. So one of the side effects in Estonia was that uh, the inhabitants uh, of the Soviet Republic got much better access to banned literature, be it uh, political writings or be it spiritual writings, uh, much more than before, because... Uh, with a growing number of visitors who, who came to Tallinn uh, ev every year, it made it much easier to smuggle literature across the border, be it books or journals, uh, which then were supposed to counteract the censorship policy and the official state propaganda in the Soviet Union. 
Mm. In the beginning, it was, of course, developing on a small scale. Uh, already, like in the late 1960s, uh, many Bibles found their way into Estonia because uh, in the mid-60s, a new, a new Estonian translation of the Bible had been um, uh, published by the Estonian church in exile. So... Um, uh, especially pensioners, Soviet Estonian pensioners who had visited their families in Sweden, uh, increasingly tried to, to get uh, issues or printings of these Bibles uh, to their home country, or even visiting exiled Estonians tried to, to, uh, to get the Bibles through, through the customs controls. But it was first and foremost, if we talk about spiritual writings, it was first and foremost a quite interesting network of Finnish Baptists who started uh, quite a large-scale uh, smuggling activity of um, spiritual literature from, from Finland, not only to Soviet Estonia, but, but actually to the whole of the Soviet Union. But um, the, the ferry connection between Helsinki and, and Tallinn was one of the main, main routes on which um, spiritual writings, not only in Estonia, but also in Georgia, and in Latvia, and Lithuania, and so on, uh, found their way into the Soviet Union. Um, but soon it was also historical and uh, political literature that was smuggled to, to, uh, to Estonia, especially uh, books and journals published by the exile, uh, be it in, in Sweden or North America. For example, I don't know if some of you have heard the name of Andres Küng, who was, um, uh, who was a, a journalist and, and he, he was very productive. He, he wrote a lot of uh, books on the situation in the Baltic republics, not only, but, but about uh, dictatorships, be it in Latin America or in Eastern Europe, or on colonialism in general. In general. Uh, and his books also were quite uh, spread in Soviet Estonia as early as in the first half of the 70s. Uh, Mart Lahr uh, remembered that as a teenager he had the first uh, copied uh, copied um, issue of, of one of Andres King's books uh, in his hand. So these uh, these smuggled books were either passed from hand to hand uh, or or photographed, which was uh, because copy machines were not accessible. The few copy machines that that were accessible were at the Soviet authorities. They were very much under control. So uh, to photograph books was was one way to to secure that a broader circle of readers could uh, take part of uh, the information. Mm, it, is, it is hard to say, I, I try to come to a conclusion, but, but it's hard to say to what degree this, uh, this excess to banned writings uh, influenced oppositional discourses in Soviet Estonia itself. But what I found very interesting is the fact that um, there were obvious parallels between the political strategies of the exiles on the one hand and the strategies of the Estonian dissident movement on the other hand, which, um, yeah, which, which, started, uh, which started off in, in, in the early 70s. Uh, just, just two words about the Estonian dissident movement. It started actually already in 1969, but it was um, the so-called democratic movement of the Soviet Union, which in its majority had uh, Russian members, actually. Um, and then in 19, around 1970, uh, a faction broke off and became more radically, radically na nationalist uh, and started a kind of genuine Estonian national movement, an Estonian dissident movement. It was uh, two... two uh, conspirational uh, associations. One was uh, the Estonian National Front, and the other one was uh, the Estonian Democratic Movement. And um, in 1972, there was uh, it was the beginning of the of uh, the preparations for the Conference of Security and, and Cooperation in Europe, which which then ended with the signing of the Helsinki Final Act in, in 1975, and um, this is just a little excursion. And, um, and the problem was that a multinational agreement signed by both the communist states and the Western European states uh, meant de facto a recognition of the post-war borders, which um, 
which led to uh, a much larger degree of political activity among the exile, uh, because the main uh, content of political activities had been the non-recognition. So if, if uh, in Helsinki, 35 delegations sit together and sign this, uh, this final act, this is anyway a de facto recognition that the borders are as they were in 1945, which means that uh, the Baltic states uh, are part of the Soviet Union. And of course, via radio, via, via visits, uh, the Estonians in Estonia were very much aware of this, and uh, the Estonian dissident movement was aware of the fact that uh, this um, this uh, multinational uh, treaty was being prepared. So at this point, um, the dissident movement consciously chose to turn to a Western public. Up to then, the the dissidents had been had been. Um, uh, had limited their activities to a very small circle because it was in a, in a society like uh, the Soviet Union, it was uh, not possible to, to include a broader range of people into these uh, clandestine activities. So basically what, what happened was that uh, uh, the political situation was discussed with close friends only. But at this point when news about the Conference of Security and Cooperation in Europe reached Estonia, the dissidents decided now we have to do something on a broader scale. We have to uh, turn to the West. And this they did with an appeal which was um, addressed to the United Nations and which, which then was signed by these two Estonian dissident organizations, the Estonian National Front and the Estonian Democratic Movement. And the, the, the story behind this... Uh, behind this memorandum, behind this appeal, is quite interesting because it was uh, actually written in October 1972 uh, and the dissidents consciously chose not to write this document themselves but they, they, they assigned this task to a group uh, who were outside the dissident circles. It was, uh, among others, Tune Kellam and a number of other historians from, from, from Tartu University who, who wrote this document. Um, but it was first in 1974 that it actually reached uh, the West. Um, I will come back to this uh, in a moment. But um, this appeal to the United Nations, uh, the aim behind this appeal to the United Nations was to, was to uh, raised the awareness of the situation in the Soviet Baltic Republics on an international level and was supposed to contribute to ending the, I quote, colonial rule of Moscow over the Soviet Baltic Republics. And, and the proposal was then, or the appeal to, to the United Nations was to organize uh, a, referem a referendum carried out in Estonia about uh, a possible independence and um, secession from the Soviet Union. And what was interesting, I talked about the parallels between political discourses uh, in exile and in the homeland. Uh, the interesting fact was that uh, the strategies of turning to the United Nations was something that uh, the exile community had been doing for, for a couple of years already. There was this um, exile Baltic organization named Batun, the Baltic Appeal to the United Nations, uh, which was founded in 1966 in order to supply the UN headquarters in New York with currently updated information about what was happening behind the Iron Curtain and, and especially in the occupied Baltic states. And um, as the document of the dissidents also touched upon the topic of Soviet colonialism, uh, this was equally uh, a rhetorical strategy which was applied by uh, by many exiles. Andres Küng wrote entire books about uh, Soviet colonialism um, and it was also an important part of the exiles' lobbying strategies uh, or activities in the West because uh, at the times, if we think about uh, the 1960s, uh, decolonization was a big topic at the time. So it was uh, not only Western governments, but also many intellectuals and social movements uh, in the West fought actively for decolonization around the globe, which was then, of course, um, mainly coined to the third world, but the 
the Baltic exiles try to to sneak into this uh, this discourse to integrate the the Soviet course uh, into this larger discourse on, on colonialism, which then of course uh, in the West um, triggered some 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 very different uh, reactions because according to to Marxist thinking, which was very strong at the time in in in, in the West. Uh, the Soviet Union couldn't be colonialist. It's it's anti-imperialist, so it can't be colonialist. So, but um, anyway, um, this was a striking parallel. This uh, both this turning to to the UN and uh, and uh, speaking about uh, colonialism, so using the same terminology. Um, so, this actually to answer this question, how, how much uh, this. Uh, Rhetorics or these strategies of the dissidents were influenced by uh, by the exile or by the West in general. Uh, to answer this question, I think um, more deep going uh, research is, is actually needed. Um, but whatsoever, I mean, w whatever influences they were, uh, we have to see this dissident appeal, which then arrived in the West in 1974, as a um, central. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a crucially, crucially important watershed moment in the history, not only of the Estonian exile, but also in the homeland, because it was the first time that uh, oppositional circuits in Soviet Estonia had used this connection to the West for their own political purposes. And uh, as I told you, it, it was written in 1972, but arri arrived in the West first in 1974. And I have read many attempts to reconstruct uh, the itinerary of this document. And uh, the prob this is, again, the problem of, of uh, the phenomena I'm, I'm focusing on. It was clandestine, uh, it was clandestine activities. It was uh, very loose networks. Uh, the, the hands in between didn't know what the other ones were doing. So for us historians, it's very hard to reconstruct these kinds of of networks, and, and even Tunne Kellam, who wrote this document, uh, couldn't to 100% tell how this document reached the West. Um, but everything uh, turns to the fact that it was actually, uh, again, the Finnish Baptists, who, um, in spite of their, their major aim to, to spread spiritual readings uh, in the Soviet Union, sometimes were ready to, to take uh, documents of political uh, content back to Finland and then contact uh, the exile community in Stockholm, which actually um, developed a kind of cooperation with these Finnish believers and thus had once again a kind of Finnish bridge to, um, to uh, ensure the communication across the Baltic Sea. Um, and as this um, memorandum was uh, approved as authentic, that was not clear from the beginning. Uh, it could have been a KGB provocation. It could also have been a Western fabrication. Uh, but as soon as uh, several exile activists um, confirmed that this document uh, actually was authentically written by, by Estonian dissidents, it was then widely disseminated by exile activists, both in Sweden and North America, and used for anti-Soviet lobbying in Western media. And at the same time, and this is an important mechanism for, for this uh, communication between East and West in general in the Cold War, at the same time, the content of the memorandum was broadcasted back via radio, so the dissidents in Soviet Estonia could uh, get a confirmation that the document actually had come through. So this was uh, the confirmation that the channels ac actually worked. Um, and this was uh, the beginning of a of a much larger flow of, of all kinds of appeals and open letters uh, drafted and signed by not only Estonian, but also Latvian and, and, and Lithuanian dissidents, um, which then were usually smuggled via Finland uh, to Stockholm, and then from Stockholm disseminated by exile activists for a wider international public. So we can see that uh, the exile in Stockholm played a kind of key role as a mediator for, for messages from behind the Iron Curtain, from the Soviet Baltic territories, uh, and as a kind of mouthpiece of the Estonian descent in the West. And already from 19, 
75 onwards, the channels worked much better. So it didn't take two years for each document to, to come through, but sometimes it was possible to get documents through within a month, which was a, a huge step uh, forwards. Um, so I, I talked about the, the important role of the exile in Stockholm for this kind of clandestine communication, but um, at the same time it has to be stressed that um, that the exile in Stockholm preferred to have this passive role, to have this passive role as, as a recipient, as, as, as a mediator who, who takes the messages to, uh, and, and sees to it that, they are that its contents are disseminated in the West. But uh, there was a, an old rule uh, of the political exile leadership in Stockholm that said, uh, we are not interfering in any way on Soviet territory. This is, this is too dangerous. Uh, the, the networks of the KGB work too well, and infiltration is always uh, a risk. So um, another point was, of course, uh, the concern for the personal security of the dissidents. So, so they said, we are we're just receiving messages. We are not going to interfere in any ways, even if we can use these secret channels um, uh, for, our, for, for our own political purposes. Um, so basically, what was the only way which was acceptable to interfere was to, to, uh, to um, support private visits, to, to support the, the flow of information and to smuggle banned writings to the Soviet Union. But there was one uh, very important exception. I don't know at, at all if, if the name sounds familiar. Uh, to anyone here. And this is uh, the, at the time, already retired businessman, Ant Skippar, from Stockholm. Uh, he was actually uh, politici politically active in, in, in exile organizations in the late 40s, but he eventually stepped back from, from political life. There was some alleged electoral fraud or something. Um, and he was, uh, throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s, he was uh, one of those who uh, very much opposed any kinds of private visits to, to Soviet Estonia. He, he was among the very conservative camp, and he, he saw every kinds of uh, family visits or a private visit to Estonia as a national treason. But in 1978, he entered the stage, and he established the East Evangelist of Babato Svetli at Abistamiskeskos, the relief center for Estonian prisoners of conscience, in Stockholm, which was a humanitarian aid organization which was modeled on Amnesty International, which only one year before had won the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, and his initial aim was to provide humanitarian aid for the dissidents who, in the first larger dissident trial in 1975, had been confined to imprisonment in Russian camps. And it was interesting enough, it was uh, actually the smuggled memorandum which uh, contributed to, to their arrest. It was, um, it was first done. This was the risk which they consciously took, that if we now appeal to the United Nations, if we turn to a broader public in the West, uh, even the, the Soviet authorities will know about our existence. And this was actually what brought them to fall. So in 1975, the, the whole dissident leadership had been uh, imprisoned and then sentenced to several years of uh, in, imprisonment in, 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 in deeper Russia somewhere. Mm, so the aim of this organization was to, to uh, send packages to, to the political prisoners and to their family back in, in, in Estonia to, to support the wives and, and children. Uh, but with time, this humanitarian level of activity uh, was more and more used as a cover-up by, by Hans Kippar, who actually um, had a political agenda of his own. And he is actually quite interesting because he's, uh, he's a shining example of how individuals can make history. He was basically on his own uh, in his uh, support for the Estonian dissidents um, because uh, he had... Uh, I don't know how he found them, how he organized it, but he had a number of contact partners in Finland who regularly traveled as tourists to, to Soviet Estonia. And via these Finnish contact persons, he was able to, uh, to make contact with the families of the, of the imprisoned dissidents, uh, 
and uh, via this way also with the still active dissidents. So he actually succeeded in establishing a direct contract, contact, a direct channel of communication uh, with the nationalist underground and became the most important bridge uh, between the exile in Stockholm and Estonian dissidents. So this was, uh, we're approaching already the uh, 1980s and this was the time when this uh, legendary cruise ship, uh, Georg Ott, um, uh, cruised between Helsinki and Tallinn, which you see here is uh, actually the, the harbor of, of Helsinki. Here you see another picture of it. It was actually, uh, it started its, uh, its tours across the Gulf of Finland in 1980 when, when the Soviet Union held the Olympic Summer Games and part of it, the sailing part, was, was uh, held in Tallinn. So you can see it's the official uh, Olympiad carrier. So until today, this, uh, this uh, ship has a kind of uh, mm, mythical importance uh, for Estonians. It was, at, at this time, it was a kind of, uh, it was the Van Gelaev. It was the white ship, which, which again is, is a, a well-known metaphor in Estonian history. Uh, it was a promise of, of lush consumerism, of, of luxury, of, of the, of the West, it was the impersonment of the West. Um, but at the same time, it was also uh, a carrier of all kinds of uh, smuggled goods, which, which came then with the tourists. It was not only about uh, smuggling Bibles and, and uh, political writings. It was uh, the black market in Tallinn was very grateful and, and in absorbing all kinds of coveted items that reached uh, Tallinn with the masses of... Uh, of Finnish tourists, be it blue jeans or, or nylon stockings or music records or pornographic journals. It was, it was a wide range of, of um, items that found their way to, to Tallinn on this, um, on this white ship. But for um, Kippar and his relief center, this ship was actually the, the literal bridge. It was, it was uh, the ideal means of communication with the, with the dissidents. Um, because messages could be typed on interlining cloth and then soon into into the jacket, which was a, a, a method which was widely used even between Poland and, and, and Sweden and in different um, in different contexts. Uh, or messages were photographed on microfilms and smuggled uh, through through the, the customs controls, and some of the crew members on the Georg Ots were also on Anskipar's playlist. So, so they also organized for some kind of uh, organized smuggling of letters uh, between Tallinn and Stockholm. So um, the, the ferry connection can thus be seen as the main conspirational channel between the exile in Sweden and the homeland opposition. There was another channel as well, which, which uh, had nothing to do with the Baltic Sea, which was uh, frequently used even by, by Russian dissidents and this was uh, Moscow. This was the most international city of the Soviet Union. There you had the Western diplomats, you had the Western journalists, media correspondents, whatever. And uh, Estonian dissidents had um, uh, established a very well-functioning cooperation, especially with the Swedish radio, TV, and newspaper journalists, and with American journalists who agreed to smuggle uh, messages uh, all writings uh, across the border and bring them to Stockholm to, to the to the exile organizations. Um, and um, yeah, what was the outcome of Kippers activity? He became actually a kind of major hub for disseminating uncensored news, fresh, updated, uncensored news of what was happening in Estonia. He had an excellent contact network among among Western media. So his name appears all over in, in, in Western newspapers of the time when it was about what was happening in Estonia. And he had a very good contact to, to the Estonian section of Radio Free Europe in Munich. So uh, as soon as he got information, it, uh, it, the next day it was uh, broadcasted back to Estonia. So it was an incredible, incredibly efficient network which this one man uh, could build up through his, through his contact persons around the Baltic Sea. Uh, and he was also at the same time uh, the main addressee of Samizdat, of, um, of uh, uh, 
unofficial banned text written by the Estonian dissidents themselves. You see here um, the covers of two books which uh, Kipa published uh, in, in Stockholm in the early 80s. Um, and uh, yeah, you see it's uh, Lisandusi it's called, which was uh, the name of a, of a dissident newspaper, uh, or newspaper, dissident journal in, in Estonia. Lisandusi mõtled ja uudiste vabale levikule Eestis. So um, these are the collected works which he then uh, uh, printed and, and uh, made accessible for a larger public. And even the, the, the writing or the production of, of Sami's that writings in Estonia was, was closely connected to the context with the West because it was sometimes possible to, to smuggle small travel typewriters into the Soviet Union, which, which could be used for, uh, for, um, uh, for duplicating text. It was, I talked to Eva Pernaste, who was later uh, active in this... Um, yeah, the first independence uh, party in, in Estonia. And she told me that uh, it was horribly, it was, it was incredibly uh, difficult to, to type anything, to, 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 to uh, multiply, how do you call it? To, to, um, yeah, reproduce, thank you. Uh, any kinds of writings, because all typewriters were registered. Uh, all typewriters at, at authorities were registered and the KGB had writing samples of each typewriter. So as soon as you used one of those typewriters to, to, to reproduce uh, non, not approved political texts, uh, the KGB could very quickly uh, find the typewriter used. So, so therefore it was very important to get in typewriters from outside. And Eva Pernas told me that um, she usually took one of the small typewriters uh, to the summer house of her mother, which was deep in the forest, somewhere in, 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 uh, in southern Estonia. And she used to type in the nights because no neighbors would hear. And she put, she told me she put, uh, to make the work more efficient, she put 11 uh, sheets of paper into the typewriter and then really tried to, to, hit, to hit hard to, to make the, the, the copies go through until the 11th page. And the first page, which was, which was best readable, was always used uh, for photographs. Lagle Parek told me that she, she had a whole uh, machinery of, uh, in her bathroom of reproducing photos. So she, uh, she took the first page and photographed it and, and uh, reproduced the photos uh, in her apartment. So sometimes the electricity just went off because it was too much, uh, too much things she had, she had in use at the time. Um, yeah, so these were these uh, summits that um, networks, uh, and as I said, Kippar was was in many ways a lonely wolf, uh, but his network was small and it, it involved only a small number of persons. But in a in in a such hermetically closed society such as the Soviet Union, even small openings uh, had had. Uh, were of utmost importance. And this became obvious uh, during the huge dissident trials in the, in the early 80s. It was, uh, there was a huge wave of arrest in 1983 when practically the whole dissident movement was decapitated. And, and um, the, the main accusations during the trials were, uh, as I quote um, the, the, the verdict, uh, illegal, illegal contacts with the illegal, uh, with an illegal organization called Relief Center in Stockholm. So it was, again, the contact uh, with the exile community which was held against them as the main accusation. Um, yeah, this is basically the end of this uh, short overview of my research results. Mm. But as we have seen that there were two different strands of contacts which develop, developed and which both had a certain degree of, of a political nature. And in both cases, Sweden was, was a decisive hub to, to coordinate um, these channels of communication across the Iron Curtain. So we had on the one hand, 
the dialogue which developed between intellectual elites and exile and Soviet Estonia, which at first glance appeared to be pronouncedly unpolitical, cultural context or, 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 or scholarly context, but which in fact started a kind of political and ideological convergence between exile and, and homeland, at least um, as far as the intelligentsia was concerned. And on the other hand, as we have seen, uh, there was this uh, parallel level of contacts between the dissident movement and Kippur, who then represented a much more radical faction of uh, exile activists in Stockholm. And due to his activity, anti-Soviet opposition, at least in the early 1980s, could develop in a kind of cross-border network, which, which then joined forces. So at the end of the day, it is um, for us historians, it is quite hard to concretely to concretely measure the historical relevance of these uh, of these uh, various levels of, of political contacts that developed between Soviet Estonia and the exile, but it is beyond doubt that these um, levels of communication have uh, left visible traces, and these traces became then visible with the onset of Gorbachev's uh, perestroika, uh, with the establishment of an official oppositional front in Estonia uh, from 1988 onwards, a whole variety of contacts uh, unforeseen uh, could develop. It was in, in the guise of political exchange, of cultural, scholarly, uh, even economic exchange between exile and, ho in, and homeland. And I think these processes uh, cannot be properly understood without this uh, background of networking processes which uh, developed before perestroika, as uh, many of the opposition leaders in Soviet Estonia had been in contact with exile circles before, and even their political visions were strongly influenced by, these, uh, by, by the contact to the exile community and the knowledge about the lobbying activities which uh, had been uh, which had been uh, um, mm, promoted by, by the exile community for, for many decades. And even uh, the smuggling networks, which I talked about, uh, of, of Anskipar's Relief Center, could be revived uh, as early as in, in 1985 or 1906. And this time, uh, the Relief Center organized the smuggling of uh, technical equipment uh, across uh, across the border, which then could could be used by uh, by the developing independence movement, and uh, this smuggling of, of technical items uh, was uh, actually directly funded by by uh, the American government. It was the National Endowment of uh, for Democracy, which which uh, sent uh, money every three months to to Stockholm. Hans Kipper was already dead. Uh, in, by that time, he died in 1987, but his successor was very active in uh, organizing the smuggling of technical equipment uh, up to 1991, at a time when things could have been brought into the country legally, but uh, still the involved preferred to, to, to bring in this equipment uh, on these smuggling ways so that, it not, so that it wouldn't be registered by the KGB. Um, so it was everything from video cameras and, and tape recorders and even the first computers uh, which reached uh, Estonia in the late 1980s. So in the end, the opposition movement was technically much, much better equipped uh, than the Soviet authorities themselves. Um, yeah, so in the end, I think, uh, if I, if I uh, dare to go that far, that... Uh, even Estonia's successful transformation after 91 uh, was, to a certain degree at least, the result of these uh, networking processes which uh, had their beginnings in the 1970s um, in Sweden. So there was, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, only one aspect, aspect of my dissertation. Uh, Peter told you that uh, the book is soon to to come out, it, it, it will, it will uh, take some time. In, in June, I will um, submit the entire manuscript, uh, which I've been uh, working on the whole winter. Um, and uh, if everything goes well, it will be uh, 
uh, edited in the Harvard Cold War Studies uh, book series um, in the US. And, and then uh, certainly find a much broader audience, not only Estonians, be it in exile or, or in, 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 in Canada, in, in Sweden or wherever, um, but among a broader international uh, public. And I, I hope it will be possible to uh, to publish it in an Estonian version, even in Estonia. Many of my interview partners have uh, said that it, it certainly would be a good idea to, to reach a more broader Estonian public, not only the scholarly community. Uh, but everything uh, will uh, become clear in a couple of months. And uh, at the moment, as Peter said, I'm, I'm uh, researching on my new topic on the topic of economic reforms uh, in, the, in um, Soviet Estonia from 1988 onwards. And I'm uh, especially concentrating on the impact of Western advisors and business partners on the implement implementation of these reforms. And this is not only uh, limited to the exile, but uh, Finnish and Swedish advisors played a, a very important role in, in Estonia as well. Uh, but still, there is a lot of, as I've learned now, there's a lot of research still to be done here in Toronto. So um, I guess uh, we haven't met for the last time. I will certainly come back. Um, but yeah, but thank you for your attention. And uh, we can discuss if there are questions. Of course, I try to answer them. Frederick, thank you. Questions? The mic, uh, I was just uh, curious uh, and interested. Um, as you know, the Estos were a big uh, thing in the exile uh, community. And I was in Stockholm in 1980 for mm -hmm. Stockholm uh, Esto, Esto which was a very big event. And Hello? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, about the Esto 80 uh, in Stockholm, which was a very successful uh, uh, event uh, with even political, uh, um, politicians in Stockholm, in Sweden, were talking and so forth. And there was also the, if you remember, the Baltic cruise, mm -hmm. which, uh, mm -hmm. which was a part of it. Mm -hmm. And how much of an importance do you think Esto had to, to the... Um, to the whole issue, for it depends for whom. Uh, I think Esto had 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 uh, 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 an importance that cannot be underestimated, be it for uh, for the West or for for Estonia. Mm -hmm. It was um, uh, you mentioned Esto in Stockholm, nineteen eighty. This was absolutely a watershed moment in in Sweden, mm -hmm. for example, where where the Baltic issues had been. Uh, had been a, a kind of bad suppressed memories. You, you had this uh, extradition of, of uh, mostly Latvian soldiers in 1946, and Swedes uh, preferred not to talk about the Baltic states. There were so many things. Sweden, for example, was the only Western state which de facto recognized the annexation in 1940. So Sweden played uh, a very ambiguous role. Uh, on the one hand, as a harbor for the exile community and giving them at least, um, uh, if you think about the neutrality doctrine, an incredible amount of, of freedom. Uh, at the same time, uh, as I said, many things were, were yeah, just ignored, neglected, or, or people tried to forget. But with ESTO 1980, uh, I mean, Stockholm was... was um, was full of Estonian pre-war flags for a week. It was uh, actually, the problem was, again, for the Swedish government, okay, we, we can't put up actually Estonian pre-war flags. We have recognized the, the annexation. But then they put a kind of little mark in the corner which uh, with the Esto emblem, which then made the flag as a kind of conference flag and not a political flag. So this was like the way uh, to, to find a, a way out. But uh, then the Swedish newspapers were full of, of Baltic topics. And at that time, um, all representatives, all uh, leaders of Swedish parties uh, officially sent uh, greeting uh, letters to the Estonian delegations. At this time, it was not 
possible anymore to ignore the Baltic fact. Uh, and uh, it, I think especially this Stockholm, uh, Stockholm Esto in 1980 ha had a huge impact on Soviet Estonia as well. It was happening 300 kilometers from Tallinn, so, uh, and via radio, via visitors, everyone in Estonia was aware of the fact that, uh, that Estonians from all over the world were, were, were meeting just around the corner, so to say. So Esto had an, had an incredible impact in, in, in many, many ways. Mm. Any others? It's a very broad... America. Yeah. I was just wondering, because uh, all the original computers were very big and clunky, mm -hmm. um, it would be interesting if you could get more information about, you know, how they were dismantled and... and uh, uh -huh. And delivered to it was uh, Eva Pernos that told me again this Estonian Independence Party, and she was uh, the person who used the first. It was the first laptop, actually, which in 1988 uh, came to Estonia and was was used by by the Independence Party. So this was uh, this was smaller and uh, apparently possible to smuggle across the border. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that was, that was the beginning of Tigri Hyppe. What does that mean? Tigri oh, the, the success story. That's e yeah, yeah. E e success story. Yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. On the other hand, I mean, uh, I haven't spoken about the Polish uh, uh, aspect at all. This is this is so exciting. I could talk about it all evening. But there, for example, uh, what was smuggled there on the Baltic ferries um, from Sweden to 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 the ports of Poland. Uh, Sweden supplied whole printing offices uh, of of the underground movement in the late in the late seventies. Um, there was uh, once uh, um, a transport. How, how do you call like this? Um, big transport vans which carry goods. Um, one of those uh, trucks, maybe one of those trucks, was stopped uh, in the Polish harbor of uh, Szczecin, and it turned out that there were as much as 70 duplicators, like the machines for duplicating, uh, as much as 70 were stored in the, in the truck. And the truck was only uh, one of a kind to be stopped. All the others went through. So it was, this is what, what I told about, uh, uh, we have this image of the Iron Curtain in mind, but you could transport whole printing offices <laughs> across this, uh, Iron Curtain. So, so the range of, of contacts are sometimes astonishing if we think about it today. Okay, thanks again. And do you, you can ask your private questions here at Coffee and Tea. And yeah, not sure, Kringel, but just sweet squares this time. So give a, give a hand to Frederick once again. Thank you.